We haven't talked that much about fishing in this class yet, and so we're going to uh, enter into a couple discussions now about fishing, about the removal of biological resources from uh, the ocean and coastal environments. And so uh, I wanted to begin that with a discussion of whales and whaling and marine mammal harvesting in general, which is probably the classic case of um, of over exploitation of, of how maybe you shouldn't harvest a resource. We have currently a variety of rules and regulations governing how we interact with marine mammals. And these have been birthed out of our long history, which we'll talk about shortly, uh, of interaction with these organisms. So the things that uh, currently govern our interaction include things like the Pelley Amendment. These are all federal, uh, federal laws. The Pelley Amendment, which uh, was the very first thing that limited um, uh, the importation of products that came from countries that essentially weren't abiding by um, uh, international standards for how we should manage um, organisms that range beyond a country's borders. That very rapidly uh, spun into or, 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 or led to the next level, which was the Marine Mammal Protection Act. This applies to any marine mammal, any mammal that touches salt water. The current debate about climate change involves polar bears and polar bear, uh, the fate of polar bear has become wrapped up in the whole debate about climate change one of the uh, things we have with regards to those guys is the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So polar bears are marine mammals. Sea otters are marine mammals. Of course, dolphins are, whales are, uh, sea lions are. The Marine Mammal Protection Act gives special protection to those kinds of critters, whether they are currently endangered or not. This is the main legislation, for example, that restricts our our ability to do sampling in Magoo Lagoon, for example, whenever we would like. Uh, well, well, after the Navy gives us permission. So the Marine Mammal Protection Act, in addition to, to saying, hey, we should recover these guys that are low in abundance, it also says we're not allowed to screw with marine mammals. If we're sitting there in a kayak and a, and a dolphin comes up to us, that's not a violation, but we're not supposed to uh, we're not supposed to approach a dolphin. If that dolphin comes up to us, we're supposed to, you know, back away. If a whale comes up to us, we're supposed to back away. We're supposed to give it space. If we can recognize that there's a marine mammal, say on this beach or or on this this headland, we are to give that critter a wide berth. So as to the theory is so as not to disturb it, etc. This has actually become a problem with things like sea lions that have become, uh, and, and certain critters have become very abundant and have become, in many cases, nuisance critters with regards to, say, fishermen's nets and things of that nature. The Marine Mammal Protection Act says we can't mess with marine mammals, even though sometimes we might, we might want to. Uh, then, of course, we have uh, the most, most powerful um, arrow in this quiver, which is the Endangered Species Act. Many of our marine mammals um, were driven down to very low numbers to meet the definition of endangerment, threatened or endangered. And so obviously the Endangered Species Act gives us a lot of teeth, uh, a lot of legal teeth to um, enforce the recovery of these critters. Uh, then we have the Packwood uh, Magnuson Amendment that um, basically sort of continues on the Pelley Amendment type stuff, which um, uh, reduces uh, people's, uh, if, if people are a bad actor elsewhere, they're not allowed to do activities in our waters, essentially. That's US legislation. M many of our marine mammals range beyond our national borders. So the, some of the most important laws that you need to know about are these international approaches to managing these resources. The International Whaling Convention, B 
begins in 1946. We'll talk more about this in a sec. But um, the convention starts. It's an international convention. And that leads to the creation of the IWC, the International Whaling Commission, which begins in 1948 and has been going ever since. This is the international body that regulates whaling, the, the, the killing of whales. We have similar conventions for things like tuna and other migratory species, but the, the IWC um, is, is really one of the grandfather, is, is probably the grandfather of, of most um, effective such um, international policies and collaborations. Another international one is, is nobody ever uses the full name, which is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Fauna. But uh, everybody ref uses the acronym, and you pronounce that CITES. So it's not cities, it's CITES. It's a, you pronounce it as if the I is a Y. Uh, and it, it's, it basically governs how we interact, and we have different... Uh, their CITES governs things like plants, um, coral that you might pick up on a tropical reef, that kind of stuff. Whales are in the first appendix, um, where, where the, these appendix, appendices list all the different uh, critters. And, and again, this is updated periodically as a critter, say, becomes endangered or as we realize there's a problem. And, and so this is another international uh, tool that is modified. Of course, as we mentioned before, the international, yeah. Uh, so what is not considered large whales? Oh, things like pilot whales and stuff. Yeah, so large whales would be most of the whales you're thinking of. So large whales would be the blue whales, the humpbacks, the rourke whales, the baleen whales. Um, some of the smaller whales would be the, some of the smaller bodied toothed whales. Um, yeah, good question. Okay, so then, uh, We've mentioned before, you guys have done some reading on the law of the sea, and um, uh, it was, it was, you know, the delegates agreed to the final form of it in 1982, and it went into effect for signatory nations after 1996. Again, we are not, we, we've not ratified the convention on the law of the sea, although as everyone claims, we, we abide by the principles since we were the ones that basically created it and asked for it and everything. So after 60 countries? Yes, 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 right. Yeah, so, so Guyana was the 60th country. More have ratified it since. Okay, so let's look a little bit more at these. So the Endangered Species Act, you guys have heard about this in Khan's bio and other classes. But again, the, the goal of the Endangered Species Act is to take a population that is low in number and increase its abundance. Specifically taking critters that have been deemed threatened or endangered and bring them and get them to the point where we can remove them from this endangerment status consideration. We have two lead agencies that handle the Endangered Species Act. It's the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA. So NOAA handles any endangered species that touches saltwater. So for us, that basically means all the marine mammals. It also means sam a salmon, right, an andromous fish, that they might spend some of their time in the freshwater and they might spend some of their time in the saltwater, but the fact that they touch saltwater makes them makes NOAA the lead agency for salmon. Um, all right, what do these guys do? Well, first they, they uh, identify who should be on this all-important list of species of concern. There is a multi-step process to, to get a, a critter nominated. The short version is you or I as researchers, we might be studying this organism and then, oh my gosh, we find that their numbers are quite low. And we would essentially make a petition to, in this case, NOAA. And NOAA would then engage in a study process where they would um, evaluate the, the numbers of critters. Either they have to be on a precipitous decline or they have to be but a fraction of their known historic abundance. and. Uh, and, 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 and yeah, so basically they get triggered. The first level is threatened. 
Well, actually, the first level is called candidate for listing, which technically is neither threatened, but in practice, a lot of times that 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 imparts protection. Um, and then, uh, and then, if, if they are considered a problem, then they the the next level of protection would be threatened, or you might consider it the first level of protection would be threatened. The next level is endangered. What about species of concern? Species of concern, the, 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 species of concern is what we is a term that we use for all these things. Species of concern is not a legal definition. So, species of concern is something I use to apply to federal endangered species or state. So we have, for example, critters on the California uh, that are listed as, as endangered in California law, but not like what? Uh, yeah, right. No, island fox are federally listed. Um, they're all federal. Uh, the island fox are actually both California and state. Um, so back in the day, things would be listed both on federal and state, let's say. In more recent times, when people have very limited budgets, um, it's it's not uncommon. I'll say it this way: it's not uncommon for someone to say, "Oh, you guys already listed that." Okay, then we won't, you know. So, if the critter was solely limited within the state of California, the the range was solely within California. If it went to other states, then absolutely the federal folks would will list it. Um, what was I saying? I got distracted. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah. So we 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 have a candidate. Uh, we, this thing is, is problematic. It would be considered threatened. If it continues to decline, it would then become endangered. And the next level, which no one wants to see, is actually extinct. So there's two ways you can get off the endangered species list. You can be go extinct, or you can be recovered. And we all hope that we get recovered um, as, as, the, as the mechanism to get off the list. Um, Right. Once a once a critter is listed, either either threatened or endangered, um, the main mechanism of the Endangered Species Act regulating you and I is to prevent prevent any take. Take is the legal definition of take. Take means in any way, shape, or form to to mess with the thing. Suzanne. Uh, what is considered recovered? Like a specific number? Ooh, great question. So the question is, uh, what is recovered? It's going to depend on the critter. So it could be um, they now have to have multiple populations across their range. It could mean they have to be to an X number, an X size, or a combination of those two things. And so that's going to vary depending on, like, again, the, the critter and, uh, and, and the other threats beyond our, our national borders. But the idea would be uh, to create a self, uh, it would get removed if it was self-sustaining or had a high likelihood of being self-sustaining. Um, yeah, good. So, so yeah, so, so, so the take, again, the take here is the legal definition of take. And so that means, that doesn't just mean shooting a harpoon into it and take it away. Take means any disturbance. So, a t so again, I mentioned the, the example from Magoo Lagoon here. We have a bunch of marine mammals sunning themselves on a shoal. And you and I were walking along. And we, and I'm loud. And I go, hey, look at it. Vanessa, there's a seal right there. <laughs> and then as I say, there, the, the, the guy lifts up his head, Whoa, and, then, and then actually just lifting up his head would probably be considered a take. But, but he lifts up his head and then just flops in the water and goes away. That could be considered a taking. Did I kill the guy? No. But did I change his behavior based on something that I did? Absolutely. And so, so take is regular. And, and then, of course, if to do something like actually go take a blood sample, that requires you know, permits. Well, to even do what I just said would require a permit. So if, let's say we're doing a wetland survey, and there happen to be these guys nearby, and everybody knew it, and yeah, these guys are over there, but we have a spe maybe, another, maybe another endangered species, maybe an endangered plant that we're, we're trying to figure out where they are. So we would get a permit. They would let us do that. And then they would say, but you're only allowed to disturb, you know, you know, minimally disturb them or disturb like up to 10 a day or there'd be some constraint. And we have to keep track of how many guys we saw looking at us and then we have to give a report. So that's one level. The next level would be, okay, what if we wanted to actually do a study and see how many, how many, how many pieces of microplastic are being ingested by these guys? We want to collect their scat or we want to take a blood draw and look at, look at phthalates inside their blood or something like that. That's going to take another um, permit, 
right? Require veterinarians. You know, you and I might be able to go, but we're going to have to have this huge cadre of staff. It's going to take forever. And then to actually kill a critter, that is yet again another level that we would almost never be given um, permission to, unless it was unless it was say a sea lion that was attacking people and a, and attacking. And even then, we'd probably be required to capture it and try to relocate it or take it to a zoo or something like that. Uh, okay. Um, Right, and so, so the Endangered Species Act requires, so the Endangered Species Act, one, sets up a mechanism to determine what is endangered and, and threatened. Two, if something gets on that list, it, it's the, the federal agency, in this case NOAA, is required to come up with a plan to get it off that status, a so-called recovery plan. The newest iteration of the Endangered Species Act requires us to also designate so-called critical habitat. So not just protect them, but make sure we have a guarantee of the places where they need to, to carry out their lives have some degree of protection. Um, and, then, and then a minor part of this is that uh, it's a federal law. No federal folks can, can do anything to, to further endangered uh, organism. This is very interesting when it comes to things like marine mammals and, oh, I don't know, say like low frequency sonar and, and um, efforts to detect, say, enemy submarines. So when that happens, what you determine, what, 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 what uh, comes to the fore is that the Department of Defense say we have a job to defend the nation and we consider this defending the nation. And then another law says you're not allowed to hurt any whales and then they basically fight. It's just like the border thing. It's exactly like the border thing. So it's a, it's a territoriality thing. Usually the Department of Defense would win in those, in those situations. Like yeah. 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 Although in, in, in truth, the Department of Defense goes to great lengths in many cases, not all, but in many cases to protect these guys. So for example, the reason we can't do that stuff at Magoo is because they say, no, you're not allowed to do that because we count how many disturbances we have and so if, you, if, if they let us in to go to a sampling, they get dinged, essentially. Yeah, my cousin works out there. As a, she's in the Navy, and she says there's always... Right, restrictions. Right, right. Uh, okay, so great. So I gave you a definition of this. Look at it. So threatened is an, an animal or plant likely to become endangered within the foreseeable future throughout all or a significant portion of its range, and endangered is an animal or plant in danger of extinction within the foreseeable future throughout all or a significant portion of of its range. So likely to become versus um, going to become. Okay, so we have five different uh, families when we talk about marine mammals. We have the sea otters, the mustelids, which again mostly are not at sea. Only the sea otters are there. We have the bears, of which polar bears uh, are the only critter that spends time in the ocean. The only bear that spends time in the ocean. Although in theory, grizzly bears can go down and, and slough in the, in the beach if they want. Um, then we have uh, the true seals, true seals. Then we have the sea lions, the guys with, uh, that have a little external ear flap and have more articulated um, appended, uh, 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 flippers that can do tricks. So sea lions are used in, in circuses. Seals are not used in cir circuses. Uh, and the walruses are the carnivores that fall into the marine mammal category. And the, while it, do, it doesn't, um, doesn't have a taxonomic uh, group, um, it's, it's, it's paraphyletic. So, so it's, it's not a taxonomic term, but a practical term that many folks use are pinnipeds to refer to uh, all these guys uh, down below my list here. We then have uh, two types of uh, sirenins. These are guys that only eat vegetation, only eat seaweeds and grasses and the like. We have manatees and dugongs. So these, are these big honking dudes that uh, my, my photo editing cut them out a little bit, I, sorry, but uh, they, they look nicer than that. 
Uh, in our country, man, these guys are, are in the Florida area and the sort of southern, southeastern coastal areas. These are very, so these are sea cows, and many folks have said these are some of the origins of the mermaid stories when, when uh, sailors came to places like Florida and the Caribbean and saw these guys, and they said, oh my God, there's... They saw these tails and they would see them dipping underwater. Again, all of these critters are mammals, so they are air breathers. So they might be able to hold their breath for a while underwater, but they do, do still have to come to the surface. So, uh, you know, classically, you might have seen one of these guys and you saw this big tail and it dipped underwater and it didn't pop back up in the next 30 seconds or something. And so maybe uh, people thought they were mermaids. Um, manatees have more of a rounded tail, they're more cruising. And so they're in, they're in, they can be in freshwater creeks, they can be in brackish water. They like to hang out in the warm water plumes from power plants, especially in the colder months. Uh, they, they pretty much are pretty slow moving. Uh, dugongs are also pretty slow, but they're much faster swimming than our manatees. If you look at the shape of their fluke, you can tell that they um, are much more um, about moving quickly as opposed to slowly going back and forth. Okay, then we get to our whales. We have two main groupings, two suborders of whales. We have the baleen whales and we have the toothed whales. So the baleen whales, I should have brought a piece of baleen in. I apologize, I should have brought a piece of baleen to show you guys. Um, baleen is basically like your fingernails, just lots and lots and lots of very long fingernails that, that break up into these um, fine, whiskey, hairy like things. It's it, very similar to a stiff broom, like a push broom you guys might use to sweep, like that, that uh, consistency. And then toothed whales are obviously tooth whales. They have teeth like you and I do. Um, these guys, uh, yeah, so these guys came from, a, these guys have a terrestrial or, origin. So um, I would argue that in terms of coastal, marine mammals are the classic example of over-exploitation. I would say uh, uh, on par with the classic example, at least for those of us in the Americas, of the, bi the eradication of bison across the Great Plains. So these are critters that were very abundant. They're, they're found in different species, but they're found in all oceans of the world. And we've managed to totally nuke them. We've driven some things to outright extinction, meaning gone. I should have worn a, one of my shirts from the Center for Marine Conservation that has um, a stellar sea cow in it. So stellar, stellar sea cow was uh, like, you know, analogous to the manatees that we had down in Florida, but the, these guys were up in the Alaska area. Stellar was a, a whaler, a captain, and that's where the name comes from. The only thing we know about these guys is what we read from these whalers' journals and their logs. Disgusting, in my opinion. We also had uh, seals like our Hawaiian monk seal, which is endangered in Hawaii. We had a similar uh, critter in the Caribbean, again, extinct. And the Atlantic gray whale is uh, extinct. Other things, we've tr we tried really, really, really hard to drive them to extinction. We didn't quite succeed. So these include things like the right whales, um, our other manatees, elephant seals, again, the Hawaiian monk seals that will probably be gone, um, not, the, not, the near, not, not, not very far from now. Uh, and then, of course, our, our sea otters on, along our coast. And... So this is uh, this is what we see happening. We see we see we go from uh, lots to none. We have a long history. One of the one of the things that makes whaling a great place to start talking about fishing and overfishing is that we have a huge amount of cultural history built up around these things. So we actually can can look and see what happened. If we talk about the dodo and other things. All the stuff we know about the dodo, for example, came pretty much came after 
uh, or, or much of what we learned came after they were already heavily exploited. With whales, we have uh, we had not only do we have well, yeah, I'll save that. I'll save that for a second. Um, so, for example, here's an example of Arctic whale hunting in the 1700s. So you can look. These are very rich, uh, very detailed um, historical documents. Now they're artistic, and of course they're they're idealized to a great extent. But nevertheless, they can, they tell us something about the types of um, of critters that were taken, how they were taken, etc. So whaling begins about a little bit after we started doing agriculture, essentially. So this, we've been doing this for thousands and thousands of years. But initially, we're mostly restricted to the critters that are right in along the coastline. By about 3,000 years ago, we start to see a more institutionalized approach, what we would consider commercial whaling. So rather than sustenance, rather than um, someone hunting this so they can feed their families or their village, it's becoming more uh, of a trade item, something that we harvest this organism or parts of this organism and then um, do things other than just consume it or, or, or use it ourselves. And so we start with the critters that are the easiest to catch. So the slowest swimmers were the first targets. Tied in by the coast, slow swimming, let's get those guys first. So that includes right whales, bowheads, and grays. Right whales are so named because they were the right ones to go harvest. By the 1600s, we see the beginnings of what we would consider the modern industrial whaling um, industry, well, yeah, practice. At this point, lots of um, species were, um, had been hit for a long, long time. And so one of the reasons we had to go to industrial whaling was simply because it was getting harder to get. We'd have to start to go farther and farther. You couldn't just go walk down from your hut or your, your dock and get some, right? They were beginning, get, beginning to be harder to find, so we needed more investment in the technology to go find and recover and bring back this stuff. This was primarily a uh, muscled endeavor. Men with strong backs and strong arms threw things at these organisms. Harpoons, big giant spears with a, with a barbed tip, get them and uh, essentially either stab them to death or beat them to death if they were a seal or something like that. Or if it's a whale, stab it and if it didn't die initially, let it run out and stab it a lot and let it bleed to death, let it get tired, bring it in and, and continue to stab it to death. So that was, that was a, a way to do it, but obviously um, you, only certain people that had the physical strength to do that, uh, by definition, limited the, the amount and the, and the types of whales we could get. 1860 saw a massive invention a revolutionary invention. That was the exploding harpoon tip. So now, there's, a, there's a, a movie coming out, which you guys should all go check. I don't know if the, the movie could be crap. The book is fantastic. I've actually considered having you guys uh, read it at times, or this class read it, read it at times. It's called In the Heart of the Sea, The Tragedy of the Whale Ship Essex. Great book. It's a great book, it's a great read, it's a great, great Christmas read or whatever, because this, uh, for a variety of reasons, written very, very well, the content is great, but also it's written very well. So the book, I don't know what the, I don't know what the movie's gonna be like, but the book is one chapter on what actually happened. This story, the whale ship Essex, was the legend that everyone quoted ever since. 
So this was a whale, a sperm whale, that actually didn't die, but said, screw you, and actually turned on the whaling vessel and struck it and, and basically caused it to take on water and the boat eventually sinks when these guys are out in the middle of the ocean. So this, the boat sinks very rapidly. These guys get on these lifeboats and they're, what are we gonna do, right? The boat sinks super quickly. And so I'm sure the movie will be all this drama and the whale will track them down, whatever. But that's all that happened. That is heard by a young sailor named Hervin Melville. And he takes that and that becomes the nucleus of his story, Moby Dick, which is one of the first, if not the first classic American novel, first American contribution to novel in terms of world literature. Um, but it's based on that. So sometimes some of these whales didn't like getting stabbed. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> and back in the day when you had a, a sharp sticker, basically, in a wooden ship, it was sort of you against this guy. I mean, the humans were still advantaged, but still, that was, that was a thing. Guys would die all the time in whaling, all the time. The explosive harpoon tip changed that. So as long as you could hit the guy, pretty much it was a kill. So this was a tip that basically had gunpowder, it went through a bunch of iterations, but basically when it hit the, hit the skin of the whale, it would blow up. So it was much more likely to, even if you had a glancing blow, to, to kill the, the, the critter. So the efficacy went way up. Now, um, we st we st I think I have a picture later on, but, but um, we still, it wasn't uncommon for these big, huge sperm whales to when someone would get them and bring them on board to find broken off pieces of other harpoon tips that they've sur they'd survived another attack or whatever. W with the invention of the exploding harpoon tip, that pretty much ended or effectively ended. Um, so that was, that, that was in terms of the, we were, we were doing our best to drive these guys to extinction. Do not ever make the error that, that Americans invented endangering species, right? Half the birds on Hawaii were driven extinct by the Hawaiians, by the gentle, noble Hawaiians, right? This is a human phenomenon. Other, certain cultures are um, much more effective at driving things to extinction, but all human cultures have the ability to drive things to ex other organisms to extinction. Do not, do not underestimate that. So we were doing this for a while, but the industrialized whaling industry, the industrialized industry, that's a little repetitive, <laughs> uh, that creates first the exploding whale harpoon and then all the stuff that comes with World War II, all the winches, all the, the, the harpoon guns and that stuff, um, th those are two major um, drivers off. We're already heading down the hill. These two things started shoving us off the cliff in terms of many of these populations. Um, so effective are these, are these tools and the exploitation in beginning in the wake of World War II that we need to create the International Whaling Commission aspect. Oh, okay. Uh, right. So, okay. So, um, as with, as we, we've seen this time and time again, we drive the resource to a very low level and then we get religion and then we kind of say, oh, hey, Maybe we should do something about this, uh, the rate of removal of these critters. The IWC uh, goes on and for many decades, um, essentially is setting catch limits, quotas, how many you can take of what, what critter and where, et cetera. That eventually leads to the 1985 moratorium on commercial whaling means you cannot commercially whale. You cannot whale for profit anymore. Um, this was, they were driven to this, the, the IWC, by a huge amount of work by a whole variety of organisms in a whole variety of countries. Organisms like Greenpeace that, that really um, brought direct action to this and a lot of a lot of appeals to the public. Why do we want to kill these pretty whales, kind of thing? So is that why now a lot of the industry is they're doing whaling for research? Because they're trying to 
th that, that is exactly why all these people claim that they're doing scientific whaling. So uh, Japan, um, uh, Norway, th th these countries that are still harvesting whales claim they are not harving, harvesting them commercially. They need to study them is what the arg how the argument goes. And so we need to kill, you know, say several dozens or several hundred of these organisms to see if they're okay is the argument. Let's say that. Let's say that. We'll come to that. Um, so, uh, as we've seen, as we'll see with our other fishery fish stocks, um, one of the things we see with whales is this notion of cereal depletion. So, meaning the the tastiest, the easiest to get, the most uh, uh, you know bang for the buck, whatever it is, critters. We target those guys first, knock their populations down, and then they get to a certain point. And then it's just too hard to get them. So then we switch to an alternative uh, species, which might not be as desirable, as tasty, as whatever. And then we just sort of keep switching, going, 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 going. And this is this notion of serial depletion. And you see this um, uh, with a, a whole variety of critters. So to orient you again, this is 1920 to, to basically the start of the moratorium. And we are looking at uh, the numbers of whales caught in the thousands. So the 30 on this scale is 30,000 uh, individuals. So you'll see a couple things here. One, there's a drop during World War II because we're too busy slaughtering each other to slaughter the whales. So things kind of, they don't end, they don't cease, but they, they uh, go into a reduction. Then at the end of World War II, you see a spike, right? Uh, then we have the moratorium, as we said, in the mid-80s that uh, drives down the um, harvest, not to zero, well, some species for zero, but, but not to zero for most, but to very low for most. We see this not only with uh, whales, we see this with all manners of marine mammals. So marine mammals are like you and I. We need to maintain our body temperature, but they're in the ocean usually very cold ocean. So they have a couple strategies. One, certain things like, like otters and stuff will have a layer of fur. The reason you see otters constantly looking so cute is because they're preening because they got to maintain that coat. Make it, it's very oily. It's got a lot of oils and make sure it stays clean. And that, that very clean, uh, 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 pretty smooth laid down fur is their first layer of defense thick fur, same with polar bears, thick fur, layer defense against cold air temperatures. The next layer of defense is a big thick layer of fat, blubber, subcutaneous fat. And that is what most folks are going after. When we're going after whales, there is whale meat, of course, but primarily the industrialized harvest is going after that as a source for oil. And so that's why you see the depletion of these critters that sort of shift, shift, shift. Uh, um, sea otters are a little bit different. Sea otters, people are actually going for the pelts. But pretty much these other guys, um, it was, you know, go after these um, critters. And so we switch from one to another, to another, to another, to another. And again, you see that uh, we are now at, at something like a, a mere single digit percent of the biomass of the large whales, the blue whales, the sperm whales, those guys, um, uh, as compared to what their historic maximum was. So again, as with many of our issues, it's not an issue of why do you want to restrict me when we still have half the whales around? It's not that. It's we have but a fraction of a percent in many cases of the organisms remaining or the habitat remaining or the whatever the case may be. Okay, so again, we've seen this pattern before. You've seen this in other classes and in other discussions, but it's this, uh, really this notion of uh, Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons. So before we established the IWC, it was essentially whatever you can get, you can, you can go, you can take that. The world champions in this were, were you and I, were the Americans, especially the New England, 
whalers, they sailed all around the world. They're in Hawaii, they're in Antarctica, they're all over the place. But um, we are really the champions of the endangerment of most of these whales. Everyone helped, but we were, we were the best. Yay, team. Uh, so, uh, remember, no class on Wednesday. Okay. Cool. All right, so 1948. Uh, we, we essentially develop a different mindset. It's becoming harder and harder to get these whales because we've driven their numbers so low. These are now mostly open ocean critters we're talking about. So you have to go far to find them. And even though we didn't have the convention on the law of the sea at that point, the U.S. was establishing its 200 nautical mile uh, territorial seas stuff. But even, even then, even before that, people are saying, man, we just got to go. It's getting hard to find these things. And so the people making money started getting worried. Right? So they said, oh, my God, if this keeps up, maybe we're not going to have any more whales to make money off of. So let's regulate this, not for a conservation goal, but for a resource management goal to preserve that resource into the future. So the IWC establishes catch quotas, how many of a particular species we can catch in a particular season or year. Minimum sizes, which correspond to age. So the idea there is you want to allow the organisms to at least get to sexual maturity so they can at least have a, a period of time of reproduction to add to the population before we reduce before we have a chance of taking those individuals. It also established the so-called blue whale unit, which is a way to standardize between, between whales. It's, it's sort of a common currency. And uh, again, the, the issue here is how much blubber you get out of these guys, how much whale oil you can get out of these guys. And so it's a standard amount of oil. So for example, one Standard blue whale is equal to two fin whales, which is equal to 2.6 humpbacks, etc. So it's an equivalency system. So just like with fish, we usually talk about uh, total landings, total biomass. This is a way to sort of standardize um, uh, how many uh, whales we could take, at least initially. It also introduces the notion of maximum sustainable yield, which we'll talk more about uh, when we get into the our other fisheries talks, but essentially, again, this is this supposed sweet spot that in theory we could find that would maximize our removal of organisms while also maximizing the addition of individuals into the population. So it's, it's the theoretical maximum spot, the, the, the amount of removal that we could take that would not impact the population. Uh, yeah. So usually people don't say maximum sustainable yield. Usually they just go by the acronym MSY. And that's how it existed for the first couple decades. But again, by the 1970s, we start to get Greenpeace and all of their associated actions. Uh, Greenpeace was really formed for two reasons. Well, it was formed for one reason to, to stop nuclear testing and nuclear uh, detonation. But also, rapidly, they got into the um, uh, marine mammal conservation, the whale conservation movement. Um, right, and so we, so, so we see that shift begin in the 70s. Other things we see uh, that have been enacted to try to help manage whales are notions of spatial refuge. So in the form of marine protected areas. So a huge debate now going on in terms of the Antar in, in Antarctic waters about the size and uh, extent and, and number of cells, et cetera, of a protected area uh, just south of Australia and um, New Zealand is one example of this. And then generally, this much newer approach, which you guys have not heard of about yet, but this notion of so-called ecosystem-based management, or EBM, as people often will abbreviate it, which means instead of managing for an individual species, we manage for the, the species and the habitat and, and the associated community, et cetera, as one. Okay, this is, so to be clear, 
this is an active convention. This is an active management tool that exists. The U.S. are signatories uh, and, and, and active players in this um, group. The rules that were laid down with the establishment of the IWC say that um, we can amend it if, and so there's various meetings all time and subcommittees, but there's a one annual meeting where they, where they you know, do all the business of the year, essentially, make the predictions what we can do next year, et cetera. And at that meeting, if 75% of the people that are, active that are active members agree, then we can change stuff. And uh, we've seen this, in, this trend really since the establishment of um, expanding where we're going to be managing these critters to where now it's the entire globe. And um, expanding the species that fall under the quota system. Again, we hit this 1980s, I think it's passed in 1985, it goes into effect in 1986 um, of, of actual whaling. And again, as Vanessa was asking, we're, we've now entered the era of so-called scientific whaling. So whaling for the sake of profit is illegal under this convention. If you're some brand new country, if you're ISIS and you want to go whale, there's technically nothing. Well, I mean, they could, yeah, that's maybe a bad example, but, but um, <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. So, so what this means is anybody that's a signatory cannot, they've legally agreed to be bound by this rule. And the rule was 75% of people of, of the country said, can't whale, so they can't whale. So only people that sign this book. Which is basically, yeah, which is basically everybody. Because at the time, Yes, yes. So, so these people that you hear that are doing this scientific whaling, they're, they're doing that because they're because otherwise they'd be in violation of their own law, right? Does that make sense? So they agreed to be bound by the treaty, so then they have to be bound by the treaty, right? This is why the U.S. is not a signator of the law of the sea. This is why the U.S. is not a signator of the International Bio of the uh, Biodiversity Convention. Because we want to, we'll do it mostly, except when we don't want to do it. But we, we did sign this. We did sign this. Okay, um, let, let's just touch on, so before we, so to talk about scientific whaling, let's talk about what scientific whaling was before, you know, the mid 80s, when it actually was scientific, when it was giving us information about stuff. So to be clear, the scientists have long been a partner with the whalers, right? They were, the, they were oftentimes one and the same. Because modern industrial whaling involved investors from faraway places sinking in money and they wanted to get that money back, there was a strong desire for a good return on their investment. What was that investment? That investment was the ships, that was the salary of the crew, that was the provisioning of the crew, all that kind of stuff, right? And so they wanted to have a good sense of what they would get back. And so that's, that's what drives the first scientific data collection. Let's find out how big these guys are. How much, how much fat is on a given whale? How old are they when they give birth? All that kind of stuff. It's also important because not only were those guys wanting to get um, money, but very rapidly, this became the key, a, key, a key driver of our industrial age. This is especially true for lubricants. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. But... Um, but, but uh, uh, other things like fuel for lamp oils. This was the era, right? 1800s, early 1800s. This is the era we didn't have electricity. This was the era where if you wanted light inside your house at night, you had to light a candle. Oil lamps could burn for usually much longer than, than a, a wax a candle 
often more, more consistent usually threw up more light a lot of advantages they also if you if you dropped it and broke it it would catch your house on fire so there's disadvantages too but one of the things that whale oil did as compared to other sources of oil is it generally didn't smoke so when we burned it it didn't leave as much of a sooty residue so it was very desirous So not only did these, got, did these investors want to make money, but our society was increasingly demanding this product as lubricants, as, as light oil. And so therefore, every single whale was becoming valuable. And so we want to know everything we could so we wouldn't waste any, wouldn't miss anything. Because these whales were giant, and because these weren't little krill, we could actually do some natural history on these things, right? We could slice them open and look at the heart. The heart, you didn't need a magnifying glass to look at these guys. You know, if we're talking about a, a blue whale heart, you could fit through their aorta, right? So, so the, 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 this, was, this was, I think, I think a really underappreciated thing about this was that anybody could cut these guys open and look at stuff, right? And, and, and you could, and they're mammals, so they're like you and I, so we have some gross experience with what their organs look like. So this meant that almost any whaler that was doing the flensing, doing the, doing the uh, 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 cutting up of the whales, they start to learn stuff, right? Whether they were educated or not, formally educated or not. So a lot of these whalers turned into marine biologists and would start writing, taking notes, you know, doing all kinds of neat uh, uh, studies and things of that nature. This was also the era of, you know, that gave birth to Charles Darwin, the era of Charles Darwin and, the, and all this stuff that was going on. So really this, this flourishing of this comparative biology. Hey, we see these fossils in South America and we see these fossils out in uh, Africa and etc and people are starting to ask questions compare things and all that kind of great stuff and so it was it was all in the same era this was happening and so this allowed what we would now call natural historians or maybe biologists but natural historians is better because they knew they did physical oceanography and and geology as well started to be stationed on these ships in addition to just the whalers that knew a lot about these we started to put dedicated experts that focused on learning more about these critters. So one of the things that uh, we got from this era of industrial whaling with all these naturalists and everything was we got a lot of folks and not just them but just even even regular sailors even not the scientist folks you're a lot of time on a ship looking, right? So you might be on a ship for a year, two years, before you filled your hull up, your hold up with um, whale, casks of whale oil, right? So you might be out at sea for a long time if you weren't finding the whales or getting the whales or whatever. And so these guys had a lot of time on their hands. So one thing they started to do is they started to take parts of the whale and do art. So they would take these very sharp little tools, etch into whale bone. In this case, this is a sperm whale tooth. They would also do it on plates of baleen and, and other things. And uh, do that, and they would take India ink and rub India ink over it, and that, then all the little scratches become black, right? So all kinds of art. So some of this art was just art for art's sake. Other art was about the exploitation of whales. And so there's... Um, a unique insight, right? We, did, we don't have this from buffalo hunting, for example. Um, so in this case, we see a three-masted schooner, right? Wind, wind-powered vessel going, and they're using the, the typical approach, which are to put out whale boats, okay? Again, so this would be before we really had these harpoon guns and this and that. These guys take these big harpoons, throw them into the whale, tie that tie this guy right here so these guys are, are, are uh, paddling around this guy's gonna whoomp stab it into this whale and then there'll be a, a, a piece of wood they'll tie it off to and the whale will run until he until he runs out of until he's tired and then they bring it in they stab it and kill it 
So if you hit a strong whale, he might take you out that way, right? And maybe, maybe, you're, maybe the mother vessel follows you, maybe they don't, right? <laughs> Uh, here's a, uh, some art with, in this case, showing humpback whales. The classic humpback have these very long white pectorals, very distinct. They're called humpbacks because when they would dive, see how this little guy is sort of bending right there? They have this characteristic uh, bend in the back. That's what it's called, humpback. Um, you know, all kinds of art. And again, this is, this is folks with a lot of time on their hands and a lot of time to practice, right? <clears throat> Here's, that sh here's a shot of baleen. So what we're looking at here is um, a guy whose lower jaw has been cut out and we're looking um, essentially up at the roof of his mouth. And so this, ba most typically you see a single plate of baleen. Uh, if you see it in a museum or something like that, this is how it actually hangs, right? So this is, again, just imagine a couple meters thick of push broomy uh, 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 bristles and this guy is going to, these, these, these are the baleen whales. They're going to open their mouths. Their throats are really, um, uh, what do I want to say, distendable. So they'll take a huge gulp of water. And the, then they, it's like if you took your tongue and, and they, they, they blast that water out. And the water goes through this baleen, exits the baleen, the water leaves, and then whatever is inside, krill, small fish, whatever is there, and they lick the inside of their teeth. They lick the inside of their, of their baleen and they turn into a ball and they swallow it. So that's how these guys feed. Um, anybody know what this is? Whale throw up. A what, what? Whale throw up. Yeah, basically, basically. So this is ambergris. So this is this stuff that uh, was most typically discovered when they would bring in a sperm whale and he and he would throw up basically in his death throes. You'd also find this down, you know, when you die, when you slash the guy open and found it inside of him. Um, it's a bunch of stuff. Let's remember that even the, so, a sperm whale, toothed whale, but they don't they don't have teeth, so sperm whales don't bite anything. So we still don't fully understand their teeth. Their teeth are only on the bottom part of their jaw. Those teeth go into essentially notches in the top of their jaw. So they're not like a cheetah or a mountain lion. It's going to bite and tear into something like that. So uh, none, of, none of these whales have grinding teeth. None of these dolphins have grinding teeth. They have like biting, tearing teeth, right? So they're not going to chomp stuff up. So in their gut, they have Stuff that maybe isn't, it's not like we ground everything to a pulp and then swallowed it. So ambergris is this stuff that's in, that, that whales swallow. Don't know, uh, you know, exactly the composition, but this was incredibly prized. This was the most pound per pound. This is, I think, what did I say here? This is 926 pounds. Um, that's a, almost a thousand pounds of a thing, right? So this stuff was incredibly smelly. And so it was highly sought at. And Aspen's saying, yeah, but if you bought perfume 50 years ago, expensive perfume, this would probably be one of the ingredients. So it was sought after by perfume, other people as well, but especially perfume makers that would use just a minute amount of this in their, in their concoction of rose hips and other stuff to make, make people smell good. So we have stuff like that. Uh, we also, obviously we have the blubber itself. So in this case, these guys have flensed off. In this case, these are Japanese guys in the 1930s. They flensed off different uh, pieces of this blubber and uh, are getting it ready. Um, here's a picture from 1870. And we see this, um, all these whale casks. So this is the city. So New Bedford, Massachusetts, one of the most uh, wealthy uh, cities in the U.S. at the time because of whaling. Very, very profitable. The most, the most uh, uh, wealthy ship captains had mansions and stuff like that. So what you're seeing here in front of us is the rendered down versions, the boiled down fat of these whales that are stored in these barrels 
and that's what's being offloaded here at port. Some of these log books are incredibly detailed. So in this case, this is the log of the ship uh, William Baker from 1838, and it says in the South Atlantic Ocean, 1838. And the, the captain is making notes of these whales spy hopping, of how they're taking, where they're, t where they're throwing the harpoons. There's lots and lots of rich data here about natural history of these uh, organisms, not, not just the exploitation, but of these organisms as well. By killing all these individuals, we also could tell things like if the females had given birth or not, if they had a fetus inside of them. And so, for example, that's what this guy's doing. This guy is looking at, a, 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 they killed the mother, these Japanese scientists, um, on a whaling vessel. They kill the mother, but before they just sort of boiled everything down, they went and they're taking measurements. So how, how old, how big was this, was this developing baby in the belly of the mom? Another fantastic thing that these whales did was they're eating all kinds of stuff, right? If they're a sperm whale, they're going down and eating squid and all kinds of crazy things. So they're, they're sampling, monitoring the environment, you might say. So by looking at the diet that these get, what these guys had in their bellies that wasn't totally digested, we could learn something about stuff. How big were the krill back then? How big were the squid back then, for example? In fact, one of the main ways we study krill now, or one of the, the key ways we study krill, uh, which is this euphousid shrimp, which is the base of the food chain of the Antarctic seas, um, when I used to do this, we used to capture a deli penguin. We used to capture penguins. Penguins do not have a crop. They do not have rocks inside their, their throat that they, that they uh, use to break up things. So what that means is uh, they have a straight shot to their belly. So we would take paint pump, uh, uh, hand pumps for paint, get a bucket of seawater, warm it up. And then we'd take a penguin and we'd put the, the pump down their mouth and we'd pump until you heard them go and then you yank out the tube really quickly and put them upside down and they throw up <laughs> just like you would throw up if we put salt water in your belly and they, and they get sick and what you have is you have all the stuff that they ate but without killing them right right <laughs> yeah so we'd have to slice them open so i'll tell you i have scars on my i i have i don't have any tiger scars or mountain lion scars i have garibaldi scars I have penguin scars on my knuckles because those guys are really strong. You wouldn't believe how strong. They're all breast muscle. All they do is flap all day long, so they're really strong. So when you first hold them, it's like, oh, no, 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 no. they're hard. They're very hard to hold. I know you laugh, but they're really hard to hold. Emperors, if you had an emperor penguin and he tried to get away and he whacked you, you could snap your leg in half. They're really strong. Really, really strong. So, um, yeah, so take that, <laughs> mocking me for holding I'm, penguins. We're just imagining you fussing around with a penguin. Yeah, did I, not, did I not give you guys my Antarctica talk? I should give you guys my Antarctica talk. Anyway, I did. I gave you guys, okay, there you go. See, so, so yeah, so, um, so basically you, you turn the guy upside down and he, and he gets sick. And then they get really calm. And then they're like, they're not like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then you let them go and they swim and they're fine. It's, it's, actually, it's actually less invasive than drawing, it's less harmful to them uh, than drawing blood, for example, which you probably wouldn't believe, but it's true. So anyway, but the point is they're constantly eating. It's a cold environment. Eat, 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 eat. So they're, and they're, they're in, in the case of Adelis, they're focused on eating krill. So, that's, so by pumping their stomachs, we can get the average size of krill in the area, adult krill, for example. You can do the same thing with these whales, right? They're eating all kinds of food, so we could use what they were eating as some indicator of what was going on in the uh, nearby ecosystem. For example, we first learned about gi Arctotuthis, giant squid, from whalers. And so this is a, a, a smaller giant squid from the belly of a sperm whale, partially digested. Um, here's some krill inside um, one whale's stomach. So these guys, are, these guys eat a lot of stuff, right? So again, uh, some of those krill might be digested or partly digested, but a lot aren't. And so by measuring the size, you can actually 
It's not as if you're looking through a bunch of you know, digested soup or something. You actually can um, identify organisms to species. You can sex them. You can tell what, what stage of development they are, etc. And then, of course, from this came all kinds of, of insights, right? So this, again, this was the era of actual scientific whaling, when we were learning stuff about these organisms. To be sure, we we're learning stuff about them so we could slaughter them more efficiently. But this really was folks publishing in peer-reviewed literature, understanding all the examples of things like I was just talking to you guys about. That is not what the modern era of scientific harvesting is about. The modern era of scientific harvesting is an excuse to continue commercial exploitation. What little we're learning from this by, pales in significance to the stuff that we've learned over the, the centuries um, already. Okay, the other thing I want to touch on here is, and we'll see the same pattern with, with other fisheries, the evolution of harvest. So as we go through these different technological innovations, our ability to exploit grows. So for example, here's a bunch of dead sperm whales in the 1940s. All the, look at all those dead sperm whales. That would never have happened 100 years ago because we, couldn't have, we, we didn't have the ability to get that many at one time. And here you see on, on the deck of this a whaler a harpoon gun, a modern harpoon gun. So just like we harvested whales, we also harvested uh, uh, pinnipeds. Folks in North America began harvesting pinnipeds at least 4,000 years ago. Um, and then folks uh, in the Northern Asia, Northern European areas were harvesting these guys at least for 10,000 years at least for the past 10,000 years. So first and foremost, as you see on this illustration on the left, as Vanessa dies over here, uh, uh, you see um, the first thing, these guys, so this is a matter of survival. This is not, uh, again, this is back to subsistence harvesting, exploitation. So these guys are using pretty much all of the, all of the organism. So these are in cold climates. These are in the Arctic. Right? Not a lot of trees around for wood and stuff of that nature. So the skins of these critters became the clothing to keep these humans warm, for example. The oil was also valuable for, for eating, but also in cooking, but also for um, burning and, and light at night. And, and to prepare other parts of the leather and, and, and of the um, uh, animals for, for uh, uh, clothing and for um, rope making and things like that. And then, of course, they ate the meat. Um, we had two main approaches. Uh, there's the spring summertime when we basically have uh, open water and there's the winter hunt when we had frozen seas. So what you see, and, and, and so basically what these guys would do is they would go up and they would uh, bang the young guys on a small guys on the head with a club and, and kill them with blunt force trauma. Uh, when they were um, swimming, they would try to stab them with a spear. And so you see on the left, this guy here is in a kayak and he's He's waiting to, he's, he's going after some of these guys on the right um, where the sea, I, the sea is frozen over. Again, these guys are mammals. They do have to breathe. Um, they would wait at their air hole and these, um, these guys would pop up and they would stab them. Here is a scrimshaw of some, from 1837 of, yeah. Sorry, scrimshaw, scrimshaw is this. Yeah. This is this is the scrimshaw. So this is so scrimshaw is technically art done on baleen or whalebone teeth primarily. I don't know if technically the definition of scrimshaw if it has to be done by sailors. I think it doesn't technically have to be done by sailors, but historically most of it was. So uh, this guy is um, 
uh, in a little kayak going after a toothed, uh, the, the, the tusked whale, the narwhals. Um, modern approaches do, you know, essentially the same thing, um, but they use rifles and exploding uh, harpoons and things of that nature. So when I, I spent my 18th birthday on a whale hunt up in Barrow, Alaska, um, and uh, I went up there um, to go with Inupiat on their subsistence hunting. So they were, they were this, is, this is legal. So the, I, I, one thing I didn't mention, I, I, I screwed up on that. So with IWC and with endangered species and all these things, there are carve outs for native subsistence take. So for a while there was no take allowed, but uh, we pretty quickly came to this agreement that yeah, you couldn't take everything you maybe used to take, but because of cultural and traditional or maybe religious reasons, uh, you can take some. So for example, when I went up, these guys were allowed to take five bowheads, only bowheads, and they were allowed to take five, a maximum of five. So they liked the exploding harpoon tip because that guaranteed they wouldn't accidentally partially wound a whale and they would swim away. So that when they would go, it would be a pretty clear that it was going to kill the guy and they could get it. So we didn't, didn't have to kill more than the five to get their five. But, um, so I went up there and I was in a, um, I was very proud of this red, I might still have it somewhere, it probably doesn't fit me, I'm, I'm too fat now, but um, uh, this bright red uh, jacket. And I have this famous picture of me eating an ice cream cone with a, a tank top on, underneath and it, this is, this is you know, in the Arctic Circle, so it was very cold. And, uh, and, I have my, and everybody kept saying, oh man, you know, you, you're gonna freeze to death with that thing. I'm like, no man, it's NASA technology, and it's, you know, duh, 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 duh. So I was totally fine. But on the, on the first day, we go out with uh, Anupia, and so they were, they were, in this case, the ice was beginning to break up. They're going for bowheads. And so the ice rafts, it kind of builds up into little ridges. And so they were hiding behind these ridges waiting for stuff. And so we're getting ready to go out and this big, this old guy with, with not very many teeth, he says like, what, what you doing that boy? And I said, the what? He's like, would you come with that? And I said, yeah, I'm gonna come with you guys. And he said, no, that jacket. So he said, you can't wear that jacket. And I said, no, no, it's super warm. Because everybody had been telling me, you, it's very thin, right? He's like, you need a warm jacket. And I said, I'm like, no, dude, you understand, it's super warm. He goes, no, you're not hearing me, man. You can't, you have to wear one of jacket. So they, made, they gave me this walrus, um, uh, sort of white, dirty white um, skin jacket thing. And I said, no, I don't want to wear that, man. I'm warm with this. He goes, dude, he said, you got to wear this. I said, I don't want it. He goes, if you don't wear this, you're not going to come out with us. And I said, why? And he said, because it's red. And he said, these guys will go and spy hop. So they'll come out and they'll look around. And if they see anything that looks weird, they'll go the opposite direction. So we have to have them come right up to the, the hole in the ice right next to us. And uh, he was, so I thought at the time, like, this guy just doesn't like my jacket or whatever. But, but he was like, yeah, why well, are you not going to come out here? You know? so, um, so it's all about hiding. So in this image, this guy has a, a blind that you might think of we normally would hide behind to go for, um, say, um, uh, birds and ducks. So in this case, it's a mobile blind. So uh, there is no rafted ice here. So he's hiding behind it so that his, he, his, outline isn't seen by the, the critter he's going for. Okay, so not only does, does our approach using guns and exploding harpoons change, uh, 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 yeah, using guns and stuff also harpoons change. So this is one of the first um, uh, illustrations of a harpoon gun. This is 1870s. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, these guys go after everything, including polar bears. Uh, this is what one of the early whaling stations looks like in New Bedford, Massachusetts. This is 1763. This looks very simple. It's not very developed. It's essentially a camp on the side of, a, of an estuary. Um, it gets very sophisticated pretty quickly. And not just in the US, this is going on, again, this is a global industry. So this is uh, an illustration from this Japanese artist in the early 1800s uh, diagramming, in this case, how they would take the whales, bring them to camp, bring them to shore, and then they would do all the fencing on shore. 
and very detailed in terms of how they process the whale blubber. So all this is the whale fat, is, is, the, is the, the a fat that's been cut off of the outside of this, this whale, and they're cut into smaller pieces. They're boiling it and rendering it down. This is an amazing piece of technology. This is a Yankee whaler. And this is the sort of state of the art before we get to modern mechanized uh, industrial uh, whaling. So everything here is optimized to kill whales. So we have a bunch of what are called long boats that are designed to be rowed, rowed by a bunch of guys so they can go pretty fast to go after these critters. And the rest of this ship is a processing facility. So this is how these guys process these guys. They bring the whales up to the side of the boat. In this case, this is a sperm whale. Again, you can see here, as I mentioned before, sperm whales have their teeth in their bottom jaw, but there's no teeth in the top. And so these teeth go into little depressions up here in the top. And so they, they kill the whale, bring the, and here you see one of the long boats still. So even though they're, they're using harpoon guns at this time, the boom, the harpoon gun, go, which is usually based on the main vessel, they still use these long boats to go and get the, get the body and, and pull the body to the main ship. Um, then they uh, render the oil down. This is called trying, and this is the try works. Now this is, remember, you need heat to do this. And on a steel vessel, maybe that's not too big a deal. But on, on this guy, that's what, right? You're going to be, well, how's that work? So they had an elaborate network of bricks to insulate the deck from the heat of the, the fires to boil that, when they were boiling that oil down. Very smelly, very oily. Uh, this is not the sexy job, right, of the whalers. And then whaling, just as with fisheries, as we'll see next time, um, whaling reaches its peak with the modern industrial whale ship. So here is a cutaway diagram from this uh, book I had from the 70s. Um, and uh, everything is optimized. To, this is, this is a, a production mill for whales. So for example, we have the bridge up here, which is where they're driving the ship and figuring out how to do stuff. There's a laboratory for assessing the quality of the whale oil they're getting. Engine room is obviously down here. Here's a slipway. So whales are caught, they're taken to the back of the vessel here, and they're, they're hauled in here. With, with fish, as we'll see in a second, this is typically done with, um, with uh, uh, lines, long lines, or seines, but it's the same idea. The, the harvested critters are pulled in through winches through the back of the vessel, and that's where the whales are brought on board uh, with using these winches. Uh, next, it, and so that first part was the sort of figuring out where stuff is and where we, where we should go. The next phase here is the processing. So the flint, so then the whale would be brought up here, would be cut up on deck, much more efficient than floating in the water, right? And so that's done really quickly. Oil goes to modern boilers at a, as opposed to a tri works. Oil separate out into different oils of different quality and then is stored in oil tanks as we would store water or gasoline or, or whatever we we're storing. Uh, then they have uh, bone boilers that would also reduce the fat from bones and, uh, and cut up the bones. And, uh, and then lastly, the meat would be processed for, for sale as, as food. And so there's freezers on board these guys to uh, keep it uh, you know, good and preserved. Um, uh, all kinds of technologies are invented. In this case, this is stick, jamming air inside the body cavity of these guys so they would float. Um, I don't want to, some of you guys are probably disturbed by this, but so th this is what it looks like when they're cutting up um, the whales. In this case, a fin whale. You can see these Rorqual whales, again, this, this huge ability to distend their, jaw, their, their throat, to take in that huge volume of water when they're feeding. Um, this is from um, Iceland, and this is a, a shore base. In this case, they're, they're doing a, a, a humpback. Um, and here are the Faroe Islands that are notorious for taking uh, small whales, in this case, pilot whales. And you know, all, all schools of thought developed on the most efficient way to, to strip blubber, et cetera. So um, 
uh, on the left is a, is a cartoon illustration of what it was like back in the day, where the very, very original whalers started to figure out where these guys would go to reproduce. So they would figure out their movement patterns. What time of the year were they where? So this was back in the day, and this is modern, uh, more modern stuff, where the, the fishing vessels were absolutely tracking just along with the whales. Um, a lot of rhetoric has, has developed around whales, unlike a lot of our other fishing issues. So, uh, so while whales are excellent examples of of how we overexploited uh, some of our biological resources, they also um, are unique, right? The, the largest creature ever, l largest animal ever on Earth, largest creature is a fungus in a forest, but, but setting that aside, um, the largest creature, bigger than the biggest dinosaur, is the blue whale, which is alive right now. We've been trying very, very hard to drive it to extinction, but they still are around. And the Channel Islands are one of the best places in the world to see these guys. So the size of these things, the power, inspired a lot of rhetoric. And so you see stuff like this, which is from the natural history of the sperm whale, again, written by a whale captain. But, you know, the fear. So that movie I said that's coming out right now, the trad about the whale ship Essex, it's, this is, you know, these guys are being tossed in the air. Humans were inspired to talk about whales since we saw whales. So here's a rock carving from 7,000 years ago in Norway where these guys are diagramming whales. We have uh, classic stories in our own culture like Jonah and the whale, which, is, um, w which has a, a guy being swallowed and living in the belly of the whale, right? Which then in turn th inspires things like Pinocchio stories and all kinds of stuff. So this is actually on, on the inside of a church in Sweden. Um, some of our political history is wrapped up in whaling. And so in this case, in the Bay of Biscay, uh, where they, are, they also do a lot of hunting of uh, tuna and things, um, the, a whale is on their town seal from 1351. Strandings, which is when a marine mammal that's supposed to be out at sea comes to land, have been going on for a long time. We have these peaks that we see, for example, after the BP whale, uh, after the BP whale, after the BP oil spill. Um, but things like this show us that this is um, not a new phenomenon. So we don't understand why. In some cases, the whales are ailing. In some cases, there's been some trauma, but not in all. In some cases, there's an individual whale that strands. And when this happens, this is always a huge thing. Now, there'll be news media coverage. But even before then, the town would stop. People would come down and like, what is this giant, insane thing that's massive, right? Unlike our normal experience. We, we see mass strandings as well. And so this has happened back in, the, back in the day and, again, inspired a lot of song, a lot of art, that kind of stuff. And, and I would say this provided an opportunity for the non-sailor people to know that things like whales existed, right? This clearly played into this notion of whale as threat. Never mind the fact that we're jamming spears and stuff into them and making them angry, but, but this notion of whales as threat, sea monsters, all this and that, um, very powerful uh, imagery. Look at that, that guy's got, I don't know what, some kind of a lot of things blowing. And these guys are freaked out and they're, they're throwing things overboard to try to appease the beast, right? This guy is, I don't know what this guy is. He's obviously, he's eating some guys because look, there's some guys in, uh, these, these, actually, oh, sorry, the story of this one is these guys went ashore, they landed, and they're, they started making some food, and then the island started to move. So this is the um, Empire Strikes Back thing, right? When Han Solo flies in the, into the, the tube, and all of a sudden, well, it's not a cave, it's a worm, right? That's this story, right? So all of a sudden, they realized the, the island was actually a whale. Oh, my God! And then the, the whale woke up. So inspiring a bunch of fear, inspiring a bunch of um, 
cultural tradition. Um, right, so we talked about the, the movie The Whale Ship Essex. That's, that's happening now. Um, and so whales were also very inspiring once we started bringing things back. So here is an, an exhibition in England in 1837 where these guys have, have re-articulated a, a whale skeleton. You know, so just like the zoos provided people an opportunity to encounter organisms they otherwise wouldn't encounter, these types of things provided an opportunity. Look, there's kids climbing on it. They're like, what? This is crazy, right? It seems like something you read about sea monsters and don't think they're real, then all of a sudden to town comes this thing with an actual sea monster and you're like, oh my God, they're real. Um, that awe helps generate the modern environmental movement um, in the context of saving these whales. So the modern environmental movement takes that awe with whales and instead of turning it into fear, turns it into um, let's let's be inspired by these things. So this is uh, the first um, fine art that, that was used to raise awareness, a piece of fine art that was used to raise awareness of, um, of uh, whales. This is called First Breath by this guy, George Sumner. Um, and he's, uh, this is a, a reunion uh, of Greenpeace people a couple years ago on the third Rainbow Warrior, the third vessel that Greenpeace used. And he's signing pictures to all these old hippies that used to go on, on campaigns. That's actually my dad. Um, and inspired other action as well. So we have the story of Sea Shepherds. So Sea Shepherds was started by Paul Watson, who was one of the original founders of Greenpeace, that felt that Greenpeace was being too, too staid. And he believed in direct action. So he was the guy that went and, for example, spray, started spray painting harp seals. Baby harp seals are white, so they blend in with the snow. Started spray painting them with indelible dye because they were really gone after for their fur so that whale, sealers couldn't, they wouldn't be valuable to them. And um, so whalers didn't like him. So at one point he spent three days chained to the bow of a sealer's boat because they wanted him to freeze to death. And then they cut him loose and they said, if you come back again, we'll, you know, cut you apart. Um, so this is a guy that's really invested. This is a guy that, I mean, I should be careful here, but believed in direct action. So for example, in the 1980s, when we weren't supposed to be whaling and the Russians, which were, the, which were notorious at the time for fostering a lot of this stuff, were sending around these factory vessels to go kill whales, even though they weren't, weren't supposed to, um, things like bounties would be posted in some of these ports that if this ship sinks, someone will get $20,000. That, that kind of stuff was going on as well. Um, and so Sea Shepherd, now you guys know Sea Shepherd from the reality television show, which um, was an incredible marketing ploy. And uh, these guys used to um, sell a few hundred dollars to a thousand or so dollars worth of merchandise, um, you know, a month on their on their fundraising web. After that show, they went up to more like twenty thousand dollars a month and just stuff that allowed them to buy additional vessels and and all kinds of stuff. So, so um, so that direct action. Um, they would, wow. Well, Some people uh, <laughs> sponsored the sinking uh, or in encouraged the sinking of illegal whale vessels like this one. Nobody died in this, but the vessel sunk. Um, and then more modernly, more recently, you guys have seen stuff like this. The Cove. Has anybody seen this documentary? So what's it about? So, so this one is, uh, is, is an Academy Award winning documentary by one of, the, one of the guys that used to be a trainer for dolphins um, on the show Flipper, right? We also have television shows, like things like Flipper and stuff, right? So all these nature documentaries give pe gave people a sense that they knew what these creatures were like. Just like those 1800s, those 19th century um, zoo exhibits showing these things, people could see a different view of these guys. And so 
this was this is this is a different type of an appeal. This is not a, this is not an intellectual appeal. This is a, a, a appeal to um, love and an appeal to emotion to save these resources. And so in this case, this this documentary is about the annual harvest of dolphins in this particular location in Japan, uh, and led to people getting upset about that. Um, and, and a lot of rhetoric like this was associated. So this absolutely was part of a marketing campaign to get people to stop using dolphins in entertainment industry and, and to stop intentionally um, killing dolphins. Um, and then most recently, this is Blackfish. So has anybody seen this documentary? A few of you guys have, okay. So um, this was a docu uh, again, a documentary about orcas in captivity, orca whales. And most recently, if you guys heard in the middle of our trip last, when we were down in San Diego, um, not only has the state of, not only has the California Coastal Commission not allowed these guys to expand, this is what we're talking about, in this case, SeaWorld, the, the aquarium that uh, we could have gone to, for example, <laughs> last time. Um, we, were, we were all around it, looking at the wetlands and everything in San Diego the other week, but, um, but in this case, they use orcas obviously in par as part of their attraction, Shamu and these guys, to bring people in. Now there's a, there's a debate to be had as to how much value there is to doing those kinds of er -ee, er -ee, er -ee, as a ball on his nose type of entertainment. So for a lot of us, that seems kind of er -ee, er -ee, er -ee. but if you imagine the folks that have never been to the ocean, the folks that have never seen a dolphin or whatever, um, there is some value to that in terms of inspiring them, trying to teach them. The decision is, what's the trade? Is it worth it or not, right? For a mouse, maybe. For a critter like a whale that might range over thousands of miles in, you know, essentially a space a few times the size of this room, is that really justified? And, the cal and, and what's basically happened now is the movement sparked by this film and things like some trainers being killed and stuff uh, and and evidence coming out that these guys use antidepressants these guys feed these whales antidepressants and stuff and they're just not um, maybe don't behave as a normal whale would as a normal orca would um, all that seems to have come together in just the last few months and, and the big announcement when we were down there in San Diego was SeaWorld said, we're no longer going to be using these guys in, in these um, uh, shows. Did they specify, is it just whales that they're not going to use? Yes. Yes. They, they didn't say anything about dolphins. So that announcement was about the orcas. But didn't, didn't they say that they're going to be kind of like revamping their whole orca attraction? They did. So, so, so what they said was, they didn't say they're going to release them into, back into the wild. Yeah. They probably couldn't. The guys probably couldn't feed themselves but so yeah so they said they're gonna do something different they haven't said what it is so are they gonna turn into more of an eco resort type thing or unclear but the point is that even SeaWorld has apparently acknowledged now that this is maybe not the best thing to be doing now Only California that's right yeah. that's right <laughs> that's right so, but, but nevertheless, I, th I think it's still, it's still indicative. It's, it's very clear to me the writing is on the wall. Whether these guys, the guys that are in captivity now are still doing stuff, it's very clear that the tide, the public sentiment has turned. And people don't want to, I mean, some people still do, but within 20 years, people are probably not going to go see these orcas doing ball tricks and stuff like that. So this notion of modern scientific whaling, um, and, and, and so currently, the way we currently stand, to wrap this up, is that scientific whaling is practiced by three countries, well, we, scientific whaling is in, whaling in quotes, three countries, Japan, Norway, and Iceland. And these guys are claiming that they need to do this. Now, these are some of the countries that have had the longest traditions of doing this, right? So these guys didn't just start whaling a few years ago. And so they, their argument has been, we need to do this because we want to preserve whaling. It's part of our culture. 
and, uh, and and so we want to do the scientific whaling so we know when it's okay to return to commercial whaling, essentially. Now, there have been things like, oh, whale meat showing up in Japanese school kids' lunches. And that's, how does that work if you're scientific whaling? Um, and, other, and other things, I'll just say other things have shown up. But the fact remains, um, uh, scientific whaling is um, not scientific. The stuff we discussed was scientific. This stuff is not. So that's our first example of, of engaging with whales. Um, our next exercise is going to look at some of this data, and we're actually going to delve into actual numbers of uh, whales back in time.